the power can be used um, to solve all these other problems. What we're going to see next week, sort of if you take the expressive power to the limit, that's when you get an NP completeness. Um, and suddenly, instead of being good news, that expressive power starts being bad news because we've sort of crossed the boundary into infeasibility, or at least as far as we know. Okay. So this would be, if we had feasible algorithms for these NP complete problems, that would be wonderful news. Okay. Um, uh, but the, but the, the other way of looking at it is that the, the high expressive power of these problems make the, the possibility of having feasible algorithms less likely. So there's always this kind of trade-off. Now, um, network flow is in, in turn a special case of linear programming. So linear programming is also a polynomial time solvable problem that, that's even more powerful than network flow, um, but a little bit less feasible. The algorithms are, are, are grungier. Um, and I might have just a bit of time to talk about linear programming and where it fits into the overall scheme of things and why, um, why network flow is still interesting even, even um, in the, you know, uh, to design algorithms for that problem directly rather than just reducing it to, to linear programming. So, um, okay. So, um, so last class we looked at the ford Fulkerson method for solving network flow problems. So remember in network flow, we were trying to move stuff in a directed graph from S to T. Um, we have, um, the edges have capacities that we can't exceed. And um, at every other place except S and T, we have to have conservation of mass. The amount flowing in has to equal the amount flowing out. So a flow from S to T really consists of a bunch of paths from S to T and maybe overlap with each other, but where the total amount that you're flowing along each path doesn't exceed the capacity of any one edge. So what we, what we decided to use is a hill climbing approach. Okay. We start with some trivial flow, like the all zero flow, and then we try to make it better. So how can we try to make it better? Well, we said that we can compute the residual graph by subtracting the, the, the flow, the current flow um, from the capacity of the edge in the forward direction, but adding it to the capacity of the edge in the backwards direction um, uh, to represent the ability to change our mind. And then um, we find, so in that graph, once we've computed the residual capacities, we only look at those edges that still have some capacity left where that residual capacity is bigger than zero, and that's called the residual graph. Then we try to find a path in that graph from S to T along that path, and augment the flow along that path um, and the bottleneck here is going to be the minimal capaci remaining capacity of an edge. So the minimal residual capacity of an edge determined along the path determines how much we can augment it. So last class, we at least saw that if the capacities are integers, you know, some, some good property of this is if the capacities are integers, The, the flow is always integral, is always integral. And so that means that the um, increase in flow at each iteration is always at least one, which does give a bound for how many, you know, does show that the algorithm will eventually terminate. The bad news is eventually can be a long time, and we'll see some examples later in the class where this algorithm takes too long to, you know, converge it, eventually terminates, but in a re really long time. Okay. Um, okay. Um, to get a bound on how the 
the algorithm terminates, you know, how long the algorithm took to terminate. One thing is we said, well, flow can increase at most by, by say, the sum of the, the number of times it can increase is at most the sum of the capacities into t. Okay. So what we're, what we're really doing is giving like a, a, an upper bound in the achieves the bound, you know, paradigm sense for, um, for what, the, what the amount of flow can be. The amount of flow for any network flow was saying is at most the sum of the capacities of all the edges going into T, because otherwise, you know, if we're using them all to the full capacity, then, um, then, um, then there's no more that can enter T. Um, yeah. Is it necessary that every, uh, that this algorithm actually achieves the bound? Because it's possible that uh, there yeah. might be some really heavy right. edge to T, which does not have That's that's right. So, so we and, and more, you know, more generally, we could have the, this situation, right, where you have a, a big weight edge into T, um, and maybe you can get there, but only with a, um, you know, but you can't get there nearly as uh, with as much capacity. So here we have like 140 units going directly into T. That's an upper bound on the flow. You can't have 140. But I say actually, okay, we could look at this this picture over here. Say actually 50 units can leave S. Okay. Or um, we could look at sort of this picture over here and say from this part, from these two nodes to these two nodes, at most 70 units can 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 flow. So here, the, I guess the bottle, the real bottleneck is just S rather than come, things coming out of S rather than T. But in an arbitrary network, we'd have to consider all those possibilities, and each one would give us an upper bound. So, so let's try to generalize this kind of upper bound where we're just looking at the, the edges going directly into T in, in terms of you know, an arbitrary way of splitting up the graph. Okay. And, and the, the intuition is just going to be, be very similar. Okay. So, um, so um, say that we, so what's an arbitrary way of splitting up the graph? Let's just say that we have a partition of the nodes of the graph into capital S, which is a subset of nodes that contains S, and, and script T, which is a set of nodes that contains T. And all, all I'm going to, I'm not going to, I drew it so that, like the nodes here are closer to S and the nodes here are closer to T. That's just an easier way of visualizing it. The only condition I'm going to put on is that every node is in one of these two categories and no node is in both. Okay. So this kind of partition is called a cut in the graph. And um, so cut is two sets, S and T. So little s is in script S, little t is in script T. And its intersect T is empty, but their union is the set of all verse. Okay. So, um, Okay, so if we have this kind of partition of the graph, what's kind of the, the analogous thing to look at in terms of an upper bound on the flow? Flow crossing cut. The flow, the capacity crossing <coughs> the cut is a bound on the flow crossing the cut. And, the, and since everything, has, everything in the flow intuitively has to start over here and end up over here, everything in the flow has to cross through one of these edges. So, um, so we call the cost of a cut as t is the sum 
over all the um, all edges of the form. going from something in S to something in T of the capacity of the edge from U to T. And as ju just for the same reason that the sum of all the, all the edges coming into T is an upper bound on the flow, um, it's easy to see that the cost of any cut gives us an upper bound on any flow. So I'm going to write that as a lemma. Um, I'm not going to prove it, but, it, but it's really pretty easy just working through the definition. For any flow, F and cut S T the amount of flow in F can't be more than the cost of this cut. And that should make intuitive sense. Things flowing from S to T have to cross the cut somewhere. So, um, but this leaves open when the exact connection, whether we're actually achieving a, a, you know, whether this inequality is tight. It's not going to be tight for every cut. Some cuts are going to be much smaller than others, right? So what can we say? Um, it's not going to be true for every flow. We can start with a zero flow. That's not going to achieve any cut. What we want to say is that when we're done with this algorithm, we achieve one of these bounds. Each cut gives us a bound. If we can achieve any of those bounds, that means that we're doing is that we're optimal because no other solution can do better than that bound. Okay. So why can we achieve what or which cut can we achieve the bound for? Do we fill up to full capacity? Okay, so that's what, what we're going to conclude eventually, that we get to the minimum cut. I mean, it's obviously if there were cut smaller, we couldn't achieve that, that bound. Okay, so if we can achieve a, uh, you know, so this, this same thing says, you know, as a way of saying any flow gives us a lower bound for any cut. Just like any cut gives us an upper bound for any flow. So they're dual problems. Each one gives us a reason why the other one can't be improved. So, um, but where, where are we going to actually um, use that our algorithm has <coughs> terminated to actually define a cut that we've achieved the bound for. The residual graph is disconnected. The residual graph is disconnected. When our algorithm ter terminates, the residual graph is this is you know is by definition there's some things in S where um, you just you know you just can't reach T from any node in S. That means if we did a, like a breadth first search from S, we get some component of things reachable in S, call that S, we get some other components of the graph and we might have edges going in the reverse direction in those other components. But um, but um, but those other components um, uh, wouldn't have any edges in the residual graph. There wouldn't be any edges going from one to the other.
Okay. And so what that means, so when do we not have an, you know, when do we have an edge in the original graph, but when, um, um, but not in the residual graph, when, so when do we remove edges from the residual graph? When the residual capacity is zero. So this means for every u, v, e, so if we define s to be the, the nodes reachable from s, from little s, and t to be all other nodes, and this includes this includes little t because otherwise if little t were in this set that means that there would be a path that we wouldn't have terminated so um, for every u, v, and e where u is in s and v is in t that edge is not in the residual graph and that means the the residual capacity of that edge must be zero. And the residual capacity of the edge was by definition equal to the original capacity minus the flow along that edge. And so what that means is that for every edge going in this direction, the amount of flow going over that edge is equal to the capacity of that edge. So the total flow must be equal to the sum of the capacities of all those edges. Since every edge um, from S to, to T um, right, script D, is being used to full capacity. And I, and I should point out that every, how about edges from T to S? Okay. Um, do we have any flow going backwards that would subtract from our flow? Okay. Well, what if we had flow backwards in this direction what would be true about the residual capacity of the forward edge? Mm -hmm. Remember, because so if there's flow going backwards, what do we do to the capacity of the forwards edge? We subtract the we subtract the negative flow going backwards. So we add the flow in the reverse direction to the to the forward to the neg to the edge okay. and since capacity start is non-zero as uh, non-negative that means that this would have had positive capacity in the residual graph so not only is every edge from s to t being used to full capacity no edge from t to s is being is being used Okay. Otherwise, we'd have um, the the modified capacity would still be greater than zero. So that means that the flow exactly equals the cost of this cup. So um, when the algorithm terminates, every possible edge in the forward direction is being used to full capacity so the all that flow is crossing over there none of it is coming back okay. because otherwise even if we had something coming back we would have increased the capacity in the reverse direction which would have been in the forward direction in this picture okay. um, and um, that would violate that this is a connected component so, um, so, uh, so that means that that 
all there must be separate flow going across all these edges. None of since none of it's coming back, the only place it can leave is through T. So all of that flow must be leaving through T. And I'm being a bit hand wavy just because I want to get through things quickly. And uh, it gives it in more detail in the textbook. So is this is this kind of clear? Thank you. So um, so that means that you know this is always. So let me just state that the lemma two. So when the Ford Fulkerson method terminates, um, let's say with flow F, there is a cut C so that flow F the exactly achieves the bound for C. And um, from lemma one and lemma two, say it's going to follow two interesting things follow. First, it's going to follow that this is the maximum flow. And then by this kind of dual reasoning, it's going to follow that this is the minimum cut. And it's going to then follow that the max flow equals the min cut. So is that clear? So corollary, at the end of the, at the end of Ford Fulkerson, F is the max flow. If not, then let, let F prime be any other flow. By lemma one, the flow of F prime is at most the cost of this cut C, which is equal to the flow of F. So the amount of any other flow could send across is at most that, that our flow could send across. Because um, it's upper bounded by this cut, and we're achieving that cut. Corollary, another corollary proves exactly the same way. C is this the, the C that we just defined is the min cost cut. Why? Same thing. Let C prime be any other cut. Well, the lemma one says the cost of C prime <coughs> is bigger than any other flow which includes our flow, but our flow has cost the same as the cost of C. So this is saying that C, the cost of this particular cut, is upper, uh, um, is no higher than the cost of any competing cut. So this means that our cut that we just found is the minimum cut in the graph. And Finally, if you put those pieces together, what we're saying is the max flow really is the same thing as the dual problem, the minimum cut in the graph. And this is important because a lot of the applications of flow are actually because you want to find this minimum cut in the graph rather than finding the flow directly. Flow is actually a tool to find the cut rather than something that you're interested in uh, in itself. Mm. Finally, uh, do one more corollary is we said this is true when the Ford when for the flow that the Ford Fulkerson algorithm finds. We said that the invariant for the Ford Fulkerson method is that if you start with integral capacities, then um, 
then you get um, uh, an integral valued flow. So all the values of the, all the flow edge, you know, all the amount of flow along every edge is integral. Um, so a final corollary is to say, um, even though we didn't enforce this as part of the definition of flow, is if the capacities are integral, then, um, then there is an integral value max flow. In fact, the ford Fulkerson method finds you such a flow. And in fact, almost all the, this is really what makes the the flow a lot stronger, you know, a lot more useful when it when you can apply it than linear programming. Because in general, linear programming, you have a system of equations and variables over the real numbers, and you you can find you know, or inequalities over of <coughs> over of linear expressions over variables. And yes, you can find the optimal solution. But typically, it's not an integral valued solution. And trying to find an integral valued optimal solution is NP complete. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is this is really like a very crucial property of the flow problem that makes it a makes it useful, not just for optimization over the real numbers, but optimization in discrete problems. Because you get for free that instead of getting like soft decisions, uh, I'm going to use this edge with flow a half, okay, I'm either going to use the edge or not if the capacity is one. So you get this, all these kind of forces. You get for free that the, the, the kind of solution you get is this kind of discrete Boolean kind of value solution, um, depending on how you set up the problem. So, um, does this make sense? Okay. And we'll, we'll see later in the class a number of times where, where these properties are pretty important. Now, um, okay, in the, how long does so the next question to ask is how long um, does the Ford Fulkerson method really take, <coughs> um, at least in the way we, we've defined it? Well, um, see that we have a graph with n nodes and m edges. Um, and let's let F max be the actual value of the max flow in the graph. And we can bound that by looking at any cut, like the sum of the capacities into the nodes. And I'm, uh, I'm also going to assume that we have integer value capacities. So what do we have to do every iteration? And how long does, how long do these iterations, so how long will these iterations take? You have to do a pass search. You have to do a pass search. And how long will that take? Uh, like the number of edges. Thank you. Yeah. So it number of edges, at least the number of nodes. And then, what do we have to do um, once we found that path? What do we have to do to get the new flow? Compare. 
find the minimum capacity along the path. How long will that take, though? Same. Actually, it's even like even better because the number of edges that are actually used in the path is the most the number of nodes. But you can just do it while you're doing the path search. So, um, okay. So, um, okay. Uh, but then, and then we have to like recompute the residual graph, residual capacities. But, but which residual capacities changed? The one that we took. Just, just the ones uh, along the path that we found. So that's going to be the same complexity. So, um, so the so the main thing is this path search, which takes uh, linear in the number of edges. Yeah. Is that the min plus path? Min. We tried to find the min edge along the path. Okay. Minimum residual capacity along the path so that we know how much to, to augment by. Okay. So these are all small compared to the path search itself. Um, but then how many, how, what are, what's our only guarantee each iteration that it increases by one? So flow increases by one. Each iteration. And so that means how many iterations might we have? F max. Okay. So if that really happens, we'll have F max iterations. Um, and so what we get is, is an upper bound of order m times the maximum, the actual value of the maximum flow. And often we can bound this by like the sum of the capacities coming into the source or the sum of the capacities leaving this, reverse that. Yeah. Coming out of the source, coming into the thing. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, if the capacity, a lot of the applications, the capacities are zero or one, and so that's not so bad. Okay. Um, so we'll keep this in mind. But the um, question is, can this can it really be this bad? And I'm afraid the answer is, if you do it wrong, yes. It really can be that horrible. So um, and here's an example. It's also in the textbook where it really is that bad. I'm sure I got it. So it's not a very complicated graph either. It has four nodes. And we have an edge of capacity one that goes from one node to the other. And then we have edges of capacity F that go um, on the top and the bottom. So if we guessed correctly, what would we do to find, you know, what would be the actual flow in this graph? Two times mm -hmm. F. Two times F. You'd send F um, through, the, through the top and F through the bottom. So if you got, did well, you could just, you could run 4 or 12%, just go for constant amount of time, or just, you know, in two iterations and find the maximum flow of psi that 2f. Okay. But, you know, we didn't put any guarantees on how you find that path, so we could find a worse path. So what would be the worst path? The one. S to A to B to T. So if we happen to find this path in our depth first search, what would we do in, what would we change in the residual graph? Minus one. Minus one. Okay. This one would become zero, so we'd remove this edge. So that's good, that's making progress. But unfortunately, what would happen? Would we add any edges? 
Yeah, we'd add an edge of capacity one in the reverse direction, representing our ability to change our mind. And, and it's good that we have an ability to change our mind because using this edge at all is not a good idea. So the residual graph after one iteration is going to look like this. So what could go wrong next? S to B. Yeah, S to B to. <laughs> and if we do that, this edge flips again. And you know, we have 99 bottles of beer, 98 bottles of beer alcohol. <laughs> And we'll just keep on going. Okay. So, so this is really going to take f steps or two f steps before we actually um, get to the realize that the max flow is two f. So it's about as bad as it can be in here, and it's just four. So it's no function at all of of the number of nodes or edges. So that's pretty bad. Um, so, but, but we, because we haven't specified how we find the path, we said we could find the, you know, as far as we know, we could find the path in a bad way. What would you want to do to avoid this horrible situation? We want to find the path of the highest weight. But what does the highest weight mean? Well, so let's, let's, let's back up. Say, overall, how much flow, what determines how much flow we get along a path? The minimum capacity edge. The minimum capacity edge. The minimum capacity edge. We want to find the path whose minimum capacity edge is, the most. is as large as possible. Does this look familiar to anybody? The first problem we have seen. That's right. So this is exactly the maximum bandwidth path <coughs> that we looked at the, the first week of class. That's an example of, of um, using that first search. So and we know how to solve this. Let's see um, if we remember. Um, like one one algorithm that we had used like m log n time, uh, doing a binary search on top of of um, of depth search to find out where you know the smallest value that we could set if we included the edges that that had that value or higher. Um, sorry, the biggest value. So that if we only can contain those values, those edges are higher, we could still find a path from S to T. We saw another, a number of other algorithms for the same problem that had roughly the same time. So I'm just going to pick this one for simplicity. I suppose if we use the Dykes or like approach with um, Fibonacci heaps, we could do a little better. Yeah. So if we do that, the max bandwidth approach, are we guaranteed that we'll, we won't have an F max multiplier anymore? Well, let's see what okay. we're guaranteed. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, figure out how many iterations we might need.
So um, if we delete all edges of weight less than or equal to P, we split the graph. So let's say we bind this V. So, um, so if we delete all edges of wave V, we, we split the graph, just like before, into those that are still reachable from S and those that aren't reachable from S. Now this might not be the same cut as before, you know, because we haven't run the whole algorithm. But what do we know about all the edges from S to T in this cut? Mm -hmm. Reverse that. So we deleted the edges that are less than or equal to V. More than V. And so um, and that made, after we did that, there were no edges left going from S to T. So that means all of the ones that, you know, the all of the edges here were deleted, which means that they're all less than or equal to V. So if there were an edge of capacity bigger than V, would V wouldn't have been the bottleneck. Oh, you mean the min bandwidth path, not the max? Uh, <laughs> the maximum bandwidth path. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So that means that if we delete all the nodes of value big or smaller, then we no longer have a path from, from S to T. Um, and so that means that okay, deleting all the edges, temporarily deleting all the edges of V or smaller, we split the graph into these, these two um, components. And so that means that every edge between S and T is of, of uh, capacity at most V. Okay. So, um, so what is the, the total cost? How can we then use this to bound the total cost of this cut from S to T. V times, the number of edges. V, v times the number of edges across the cut. And now I'll just be totally lazy and say, well, how many edges could be across the cut? I don't know anything about this cut, but it certainly can't be more than the total number of edges. And on the other hand, we said that this has to be an upper bound, any cut gives us an up, the cost of any cut is an upper bound on the value of any flow, including the maximum flow. Okay. So let's reverse that and say we get, this is the amount we augment the flow by, okay. and we're saying that the max flow is at most this times the number of edges, and that says that the amount that we get every time okay, is V. And so if V times M is greater or equal to the max flow, V is greater than or equal to the max flow over, 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 M. over M. So we get some fraction of the max flow that's, that's, that we can bound every iteration. Now, unfortunately, this is the max flow not in the original graph, but in the residual graph. Okay. So what this says is that if you look at the capacity that's left, in the residual graph, after t iterations, okay, says that we get at least a 1 in m fraction. So what's left after t iterations 
is at most 1 minus that, the remaining part, times the amount of re remaining capacity after t minus 1 iteration. So saying for a while we get 1 in m of the total flow, or order 1 in m of the total flow, but as we're starting to get most of the flow, that slows down. The amount of additional flow we get is a 1 in m fraction of the flow that we haven't gotten at, at, at this time at, yet, rather than the original one. Because we're looking at the root, not here, I was looking at the bandwidth in the original graph. In the you know teeth iteration, we're looking at the bandwidth in the residual graph after we've gotten flow um, at the at a certain amount of flow. So I'm being a bit hand wavy, but is this formula relatively clear? Okay. So what can we say? That means that um, okay. So the amount of flow originally is, you know, originally that's possible in the residual graph is all the flow. Okay. So this means that the amount of flow that's left in the residual graph after t iterations is at most 1 minus 1 in m to the t times the original max flow. So every time we get 1 in m of what's left, and so what's left goes down by the factor of 1 minus 1 in f. And so then we can bound the number of iterations <coughs> because if this is less than 1, that means it must be 0 because it's still an integer value. Okay. So, um, so when does this get down to less than 1? Okay. Well, this is very close. 1 minus 1 in a, 1, 1 is a small number is very close to e to that number. This is a, so this is a very good approximation, e to the negative 1 in m. And actually, it's an upper bound. Let's see. Okay. So that's equal to e to the negative t over m, f max. So when when, is, when do we totally cancel out this f max term when t over m reaches zero? Not zero. Mm -hmm. log, log of this. Yeah. So when t over m equals the natural log of f max, then we're down below one. Okay. Which says that we hit that when t is m times the natural log of the maximum capacity. So this gives us a bound on the number of iterations. Okay. After this amount of, or after this number of iterations, there's no residual capacity left. And, uh, and the algorithm just terminates. Now, I'm not sure whether that, uh, that tight or not. So what does this give us? Total time is so that each iteration, finding that max bandwidth path takes order m log n times. And so the total time we're going to get is m log n times m log f. So m squared log n times log f. So is this better than the, the vanilla Ford Fulkerson analysis, m times f? Well, sometimes it's much better if the capacities are big integers, like in that, you know, if you have a small graph with big integer capacities, this is exponentially better. But um, if you've got a big graph with small capacities, then having a square here is really going to be much worse than having, might be much worse than having this f max term. So it's a trade off. Whether you should use it depends, uh, depends on, on the situation. Um, now, 
that said, it, these are just two of the different methods for for um, for network flow. There are other methods that don't depend on the actual flow value at all, um, like the Edmonds Cart version of Ford Fulkerson, where instead of finding um, the biggest bandwidth path, you always iterate with the shortest path. And they are able to show that shortest path length only increases throughout the algorithm. So that bounds the number of number of stages of the algorithm. Um, the uh, or um, there's like the sample is the bipartite matching problem. So um, in the bipartite matching problem, we have a bipartite graph. So we have some nodes on the left, some <coughs> nodes on the right, and edges only go between the two classes of nodes. Um, and we're trying to find as large a possible a matching. So matching is a set of edges that don't intersect, um, don't share a common endpoint. So in this graph, I guess, uh, this would be one matching, but we're, we're, leaving, we're leaving this node unmatched currently. We could improve <coughs> it by matching this, this <coughs> swapping this edge by for, for these two edges. Now we have a matching because uh, this node gets assigned, gets assigned to this node, this node, to this node. This is a perfect matching because every node is matched to something else. So we can't do better than that. Um, so is, this, is the problem clear? So the question is, what does this have to do with flows? Okay, so matching is a set of edges that so that no two edges in the matching have a common endpoint on either side. So if we use this edge, we can't use this other edge coming through the same node. We couldn't use the edge going to the same node on the right. Um, okay. So um so in many ways, this is kind of like similar to the independent set problem. But we'll turn out that instead of being empty hard, we can actually solve this using network flow. So, um, so where is the flow? Well, what we want is to say, OK, we can either use each edge or not. So we want to say, OK, well, let's make these edges in the network. And to say that we can either use them or not, let's give them capacity 1. Because now we're using the fact that the flow that we'll find by any of these methods is integral value. And so that means that every edge gets used, um, either gets used or not, used to full capacity or not. We make them all capacity 1. So we don't know this matching. I'm just putting, you know, we're not looking at particular matching. We're taking all the edges, orienting them from left to right, and giving them capacity one. But do we need to add the source and a sink? Yes, we need to have a source and a sink. Good. So let's add a source and a sink. Okay. And now we want to enforce. We haven't so far. We haven't enforced any condition that says we can't use two of these edges. But, um, so how could we enforce that we can't use both of these edges? And we can't, that we can't have one unit coming out of this node going over here and one unit going over here. To make that, to make, so we're just going to make, think we, well, if we only have one unit coming into this node, that means we can only have one unit coming out. 
And that means we have to choose between the edges. We can't pick both. So what we'll do to sort of is put in edges from the source to each node on the left and give it capacity one. And that means that we've, since we've only got capacity of most one coming in, by conservation, we can only have use one of the edges coming out. So what, how do we do the same thing on the other side? One, two, from each node on the right to So let me write that down. So given <coughs> graph G, create network. Um, and as follows. The, the vertices for N are all the vertices had before, plus two special vertices. We'll have three categories of edges for if we have an edge from left to right where in the original graph We'll put the directed, if we have the undirected edge between them, in the original graph, we put a directed edge, and we de when we define the capacity of that edge equal one. And then for every u on the, on the left, we'll put an edge from s to u, and define the capacity of that edge to be one. And for every v on the right, we'll put in an edge from s to b, and define the capacity of that edge. Okay. So that's just formalizing what this picture is. Do, do we have to have L, uh, the, cr the size of L and R be equal? Um, no. Okay. So I'm not assuming that. But it so if you want a perfect matching where everything is matched, they have to be equal. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to do is find as big a matching as possible. So how can we prove that? So, so we'll, then we'll run a max flow algorithm here. And we get max flow F F star, or max ball F. And the important thing is that F, by any of these max flow algorithms, F is only going to have integer value 12. It would be really nasty if we had, like, use this edge with probability with a half and this edge with a half. That's not ruled out by the flow constraint, but all the algorithms that we use only, only find, never find flows that split things up like that. So that's what I mean that we get this important integrality condition for fully free with flows, whereas for linear pro general linear programming, it's a major pain. Um, so, um, okay. was our intuition, the ones that um, okay, so I say that, okay, say that we find a, a flow in this graph, we like find flow goes one, 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 what does that say? You know, if we're sending a flow of one along that path, what does that say about the matching? It's the, the, the edge in the middle. 
hit the edge in the middle. So we want to take all the edges to the middle that are actually used in the flow. So if we have an edge in the original graph, we want to see, is there actually flow um, along that edge? And because, as we said, the, the flow is integral, it's either 1 or 0. So if it's not, if it's, it's being used at all, then it's being used to full capacity. Okay, so um, okay, so what do we have to 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 show about this set M? Mm -hmm. Now that we've defined it, that there's no matches that we could have made that we didn't make. Okay, well we have to, to prove two things about it. Okay. Uh, to be a maximum matching, first thing you have to be is a Matching. matching. And second thing you have to be is maximum. maximal. So let's first say that it's maximal, and I'm sorry, that it's a matching, and then try to argue that it's maximal. Okay. So from, and the reason it's matching is going to be exactly what I, what I said, you know, how we designed the problem. Okay, so we just write it down. So I'm just going to do this case, and the other case is totally symmetrical. Okay. So then, um, if these were both in the matching, what would we know about the, the total flow into V you know, So if this is in matching, that means we're sending one unit of flow from U to V, and we're sending this is in the matching, so we're sending another unit of flow from U prime to V. So that means the total flow into V has to be two or higher. Okay. What do we know about the flow into V? It's the same as the flow, flow out. So that would also have to be greater than two. But where could that, how, what are the edges leaving V? The total capacity of edges leaving V is one. There's only one edge leaving V. And its capacity is one. So that's the contradiction. So if we had edges U, V, U, V prime, we'd do the same argument, except that we'd change the flow into, in, to flow out of, flow out of, into, flow into, and edges leaving into edges entering. And, you know, it, it, but it's really the same argument, so I'm not gonna repeat it. Okay. So this shows that the, the edges we find is a, is a matching, now we have to, to show, we relate this, you know, we have a maximal flow, now we have to show that somehow a maximal flow, you know, this shows that every flow corresponds to a matching. How do we know that the, the um, now we have to relate the size of that matching to the size of the flow. between the flow and the amount of flow in that flow and the matching size. It's e yeah. They're equal. Why? Because you know, the flow is the number of, of amount of stuff leaving S. Okay. This 
total amount leaving us but the way we've defined things what's that going to be the same as you know every edge leaving us at just capacity one so it's going to be the number of edges that we use and since we, we only use edges to full capacity So it's going to be the number of vertices on the left with entering capacity one and that means it's going to be also be equal to the number of edges in the middle that are used because each node over here with entering capacity one we have to pick one of the we have to send that capacity send that flow um, across the graph. We have flow one um, in the bipartite graph. And that's exactly equal to the number of edges that end up in our match. So it seems like the bigger we make this flow, the you know, the bigger this matching is going to be. So have we just proved have we proved that our matching is maximal? Yes? No? No. Let's think about it. What would be the loophole? When could there be a bigger matching? We said every flow corresponds to a matching. Um, and the bigger that flow is, the bigger the matching you get in. Well, what else do we need to show to show that there couldn't be a bigger matching? We get the maximum. That every matching gives us a flow. That every matching comes from a flow. Because it says every matching that you get, the matchings that you of the matchings that you get from all the various flows, we found the biggest one. But is that all the matchings there are? So we have to show that the that every matching comes from a flow. Fortunately, in this example, doing the reverse direction is actually pretty simple. If you're given a matching, and it's almost you, the only confusing thing is that why do we have to do this at all and um, and didn't we already do this because <laughs> it looks almost the same as what we already did so instead of like being given a flow we constructed a matching by using these edges say we're just given a matching how do we make that a flow so for every edge in the matching, what do we want to do to make it a flow? Send one unit of flow through that edge. There's only one place it can come from, and there's only one place it can go to. So this correspondence between flows and matching is actually invertible. Given a matching, you can give the corresponding flow and so all the you know matchings are actually in the range of this map from flows and so we don't miss out on any potential matching by only looking at the matchings corresponding to flows because that's all being a little bit over top here okay so given a matching m Just a set of edges from left, you know, between the left and the right. So for every edge E going from U to V and M, send one unit of flow by the path S to U to V to T. And uh, 
that's going to have conservation of, of, of flow because we're sending that one unit along the whole path. Okay. And we have to say it's not violating the capacities. Well, where could we get in trouble with violating the capacities? Okay. If we tried to, if we had two of these paths that involved the same, we use the same U or two that involve the same V, but that's exactly our definition of matching that we don't. Okay. So because M isn't really a matching, this, this um, satisfies the um, capacity constraints. <coughs> Um, and this flow that we get then has, for the same reason as before, the size of the flow that we construct from this matching is the, is the same as the, the matching itself, the size of the matching. So let's put these pieces together. Say M prime is any other flow, is any other matching. Okay. And we need to show that M prime is no bigger than M. Okay. Well, we could construct from this argument, we could construct a flow F prime so that the flow of F prime equals the size of M prime. Okay. And what would we know about the flow of F prime? It's at most what? Yeah. Flow of F. Because F is the max flow. Okay. And what do we know about the flow of F? It's the same as? Um. It's the same as the size of M. So what we showed is that the size of M is bigger or equal to the size of this M prime. Okay. And since M prime was an arbitrary matching, this shows that our matching is the maximum matching. Okay. And, but note that to get this chain where we relate m to m prime, we needed this direction where we convert a matching to a flow, as well as the kind of direction that we actually use in the algorithm that converts a flow to a matching. Okay. So this is the part that most people forget to put in the, the argument. In uh, next class, I'm going to um, see some more examples, but then also like spell out the, the steps of a, redu of a reduction type technique in more detail.